we have a little change in the schedule. Jenny Pronto is in Chile, and so she lives there now, and Crystal <laughs> is going to be um, presenting on scenario planning um, in New York with Jerry Farms. Yeah, so you're going to listen to me twice in a row. Pam was gracious enough to take over our first one, so you didn't have to listen to me three times in this, in this presentation. Um, but it actually works really well to put these two together, so just kind of context over the, we'll stop for questions about the dairy um, efforts in the middle. Um, but in this first one, we're going to cover more of an overview of scenario planning and then the New York example. And then in mine, I'm focused a little bit more on how we actually set up the workshops. So like if you wanted to do this yourself, um, some lessons learned and how we actually set up the workshops and then some of our results um, for the beef systems uh, in the Great Plains. So let's preview. Um, Jenny and Kurt put this together. Uh, Jenny actually uh, was the first one who saw this scenario planning method, and she and I kind of ran with it last summer uh, as part of our Amalek and Changing Climate project. Um, <coughs> it was on dairy systems in the Northeast, uh, really mostly in New York. Um, and then I'll look at the beef one next. And so here again, we don't need to cover it again. This is us. And so why, did, why is this such a powerful tool and why did we decide to use it? Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting way to think about change. Um, so some of these things are uncertain and that's actually some of the challenge of dealing with it, uh, with producers, um, even ourselves, is how do we get a grasp on, on this change um, and how can we move people from being reactive to what's going to be happening to being proactive in their planning um, and this is also a way uh, to stimulate some creativity about how we think about solutions. <coughs> and so basically the difference between scenario planning and the typical planning process is, is instead of just picking a forecast of this young six o'clock news, they give you a percentage of where they think it's headed. Um, what, what we do with scenario planning is acknowledge that these uncertainties might give us divergent uh, futures. And so we look at, instead of a single, picking a single future, we look at multiple futures when you do the, when you do the process. So this is a way um, to do something proactively. Um, they often use the term, uh, so the National Park Service is used pretty extensively. You'll notice several of our references are from the National Park Service. Um, and it actually dates back to military planning um, back uh, at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. and and after that. Um, so what they often use to describe it is it's a way of rehearsing these multiple futures you might you might see that allows your organization or in our case of industry um, to look at ways to recognize and adapt to and then take advantage, you know, find, you know, we know what the negatives might be, we know what the positives might be, and place us in a position where we um, uh, can be proactive and take advantage of the upside and plan for the negative. I'll talk more. So I, I'll talk more about this as our process in, in the beef one, and I'll talk more about that in the second one. Uh, but it's it's a five-step process that uh, that she talks about a little bit here. Um, so again, we're trying to look at divergent factors. Some of the the national parks and the military and some of the businesses um, look at very divergent factors. So they include political context, cultural changes that we might see, as well as like ecology, climate. Um, and economic conditions. We decided to bound ours a little bit more than that, um, but we took lessons from these folks who have really been looking at divergent uh, futures of where might cultural pieces go and where might uh, both fit as well as environmental factors. And uh, even the IPCC uses these, if you see their scenarios, they are including some estimates of how they think we as a world will respond. So that's how they talk about their different A1, B1. Um, those are scenarios in the same sense of, of what we're talking about. Um, so the first phase when you try to, when you do one of these projects, they call uh, orientation. And so this is where you really define your project. Um, you, you kind of have to, like, so you can make boundaries really wide, or you can make them a lot narrower. And you think about what are the, the key challenges with, within those kind of boundaries. So the, the dairy group, these were the ones they chose. They wanted to explore how the New York State dairy industry could thrive while adapting to the impacts of climate change. And so 
so part of that is then, so what are our key challenges? Um, one of those is how can we prevent declines in, in milk production um, if temperatures and here they pick temperatures, but you'll see when you come to the focus groups, they might widen your perspective. It actually, the storm events actually came up quite a bit as well on top of the temperature changes. The second phase then they call exploration. So this is where you can do all your data gathering. You look at what information is out there on, so in our case, we wanted to focus in on climate impacts. We looked at climate trends, uh, both historical and projected. Um, as well as then how those impact the dairy industry. Um, if in those larger ones, they, they expand it. So you can look at all sorts of driving forces and you can gather data on this. Um, we found it a little bit more than that. So then this is where the rubber meets the road. You get a group together to do the synthesis. This is where you actually create the scenarios. Um, this is Jenny's uh, mock-up from the, from the <coughs> scenarios. But they had 12 stakeholders <coughs> at their meeting. I was able to attend, so if you have questions about that, I can give the answer. And then you let you let your <coughs> participants choose different drivers, experiment with different combinations, and create the scenarios that they want to look at. And so this lets it be a dynamic process. You can try out different things, see what and you're trying to find these kind of divergent different combinations that will let you look at the a uh, or rather robust set of features so that, so that you can be well prepared. So this is what it started to look like initially. Um, and this is then where the graphics ended up. This one's hard to read, so we'll zoom in. But you can see, so the, the temperature, dr the drivers are the arrows. Um, here, like I said, we bound it to say these are climatic drivers. Um, so our group um, chose to split it out by season because what's going on on the dairy is different by season. So this is a winter example. And temperature and precipitation ended up, not surprisingly, being the main drivers. And they went from drought on the precipitation to the little word, say, an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events. And they've been seeing a lot of that in New York State, and they just said that was kind of the, the key one they wanted to look at on the other extreme. Then temperature is just baselines and current temperatures. Um, or if we expect to get more. As you can see, that sets up four different, different scenarios here. We'll look at them in more detail. It's still hard to read, but a little bit better we came up with. There's names and stories that go along with this, because as, as you bring it out to people, kind of having a narrative is a nice way to talk about what's going on in these different ones. Um, so here again, if you're in winter, this is more of a Mediterranean winter. You don't have much snow. Um, might be some drought that you're worried about. So in wintertime, that's nice for your winter storage, particularly if you don't have it covered. Um, but you're a little bit concerned about going into the next season. And then this one is a war with lots of extreme events. Um, so they call that a recipe for disaster. So this is when you've got above normal temperatures. So for New York, they usually get a lot of snow. So if you, if you raise that above their normal, you might get more ice. Or you actually get more big, big snowstorms. Um, so they're talking about how do we deal with overflow of manure storage? There's no way to get it out of the fields. We've got lots of runoff and erosion. Um, do we have barn collapses because we've got heavy? Um, do we have um, power outages with ice storms? Um, this is just overall a difficult one to tackle. So then if you look on the, the flip side, so these are normal temperatures. Uh, with the two different uh, extremes. So this one they call, she said, called happy cows, because um, cows are happy when it's dry. Uh, it makes for a nice uh, nice winter overall. It's an easy one to deal with. You're a little bit nervous going into the next growing season if it's too dry, too dry, but overall we're going to happy. And then this one, we call it snow and ice, not so nice. So we're talking about temperatures like today, but the more of those extreme events. So this one is more snow than the previous, uh, than, than the one that's in the top corner. Um, and here again, this is where you went. It's a uh, nutrient loss, um, challenging to do water, but the lip breeze. It's kind of what we're looking at there. So then we can look <coughs> quickly at the growing season scenarios. 
same drivers, just different season. So if you go drought on this side, to extreme events, so if we start over here, this is a more desert-like area. I don't know if New York would ever get that dry. <laughs> Um, but you do start to have some of those concerns, particularly about your forage, uh, hay supplies, um, and I know they import a lot of feed, but they do have local feed production. Um, so your feed starts getting more expensive, electric goes up. Um, they're in a very urban market, and so if it's hot and dry, you start to have more competition for that electrical supply, so your rates go up. And so the other one where they're calling more of a swamp farm. So if you think of this kind of geographically, this is like moving your dairy more to like a southeast dairy type setup. Um, so you've got um, hot and humid, you've got more extreme events, so like I said, what they're looking at. <coughs> so you might have challenges with getting your manure out of the fields, finding times to get that out. Pest issues might become a new concern. Um, And then flip side, so we need to think current temperatures. And this is one thing I'll say about, you know, so some of us might be, oh, why would they think about the current temperatures? But when you're particularly when you're working with producers, it makes it not seem like we're driving an agenda. If you give them the option to look at um, all these scenarios, then they, like I said, then they can start to play with it themselves and kind of buy into the idea. So, um, so if we don't think temperatures are going to change, but we still might have these swings, because they see these swings between uh, drought and, and too wet. So they're calling this uh, arid acres. Um, it's not too bad um, temperature-wise. You don't have as much evaporative loss, but you're still in a, in a challenging position uh, for your crops and forages. Whereas the other one, um, she named unstable and uncertain. So, you know, we've got plenty of precipitation, but often it's coming in these big storm events, so flooding might be an issue, um, which leads to more erosion potential for um, loss of nutrients. Uh, you've got some good things with groundwater recharge there, um, but it can cause a parachute through it, like a, you might want more ventilation, because and just find things. So the next phase of this is kind of figuring out how to attack things. So we start to talk about application. We've identified what are all these impacts. This is an example. Um, they're currently underway of doing this uh, for the dairy industry. So we pulled up a, an example from the National Forest Service. And so you look at how are your different resources. So in our case, you know, we're talking about different aspects of the farm. You're kind of just quantifying what are places of challenge, what are places of, of opportunity across here so that they have four scenarios there. And you can see there's places where uh, some things are going up and uh, you might look at ways to capitalize on that, or there's other places where you see more negative impacts. So that's yet to, yet to come from the dairy goes. And then the last phase is monitoring. So you know, as you start to roll out this stuff, you just have to come back and to update it as we continue to see changes into the future. So with that, I'll wrap up on the dairy piece. We need to take a break and ask questions. Hey, question to Crystal. So this is the idea of sort of do a what if. Um, so yeah. What is, how do we handle <clears throat> more ice storm? Right. So the idea is, is then uh, we've been, I have a little bit more information in the B points we've gotten through that step. But like when you go back, to these, so then the, the next step that we've done with it is bring those focus groups back together and say, what do we do about this? I'll talk more about the beef ones, but it's a state of the dairy. Um, but even for, so one other thing we've talked about is how can we use these graphics? Because the producers, the, the feedback I got from the producers we were working with in, in Nebraska liked this process of thinking about it kind of proactively, and they were like, how can we best use these to get out there? And our climatology folks have kind of been like, well, if we have a suite of these, so we have some crop folks doing the same, you know, as we get our three month forecast or something, and that's not super long term, but we can start to say, hey, we're coming into this sort of scenario. These are the impacts you might see. Uh, how can we start to think about that? Yeah, 
how far out do you require your valve to be from on the impact tube? So the, the temperatures, um, it, it gets wetter, okay? So you have more extreme events. Um, you were talking, what you talked about here had to do with on the, on the land pieces, but the dairy farms can be interested in the individuals. Yes. It was, um, so it's mostly bounded by the piston. It's kind of what we said is we were looking at um, some of the input supplies coming into the farm to the farm feed. It's kind of the boundaries that the, the team set. And then the impacts. And so this isn't the fullest impact. This is just the graphics sure. that come out of it. Um, and this could be expanded upon because, you know, we have a lot of effects faculty that can kind of look at these and stand the pollen across all the farm categories. And what I'll talk a little bit more in our beef one is, is how then we're planning to take that and use it to improve our extension program. Right, right. You have the, the, the consequences and then what you do, what do you do with that or, 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 or for instance, you have more ice, you have more food to break down. Just go out and fill the participants are tired of the moon. <laughs> yeah, we usually set these up for <clears throat> our well, ours in Nebraska, they were all about five hours. And we had a lunch. Just you can only it's a little bit taxing until you to go through all of this. And so we try not to keep the, the, the national park people, they had their people there for three or four days. And like they had like a retreat. And tackle this. Well, like they kind of did these nested things within like how society might change. Them. So they they did a little bit broader take on it. So it can be done more extensively than we did, but we kind of have those things. Well, I, I can see that, that some other applications. I'm not an extension educator, but I do teach classes, and I think you can use something like this in a classroom setting as part of that learning, and you might do over a week. And one of the other reasons we really liked it in Nebraska was so we just started a climate team in, in our Nebraska extension, I guess it's been a little over a year ago now, but there has not been any program on this topic, and it's not a popular topic, and people aren't used to talking about it, and so we're like, how do we start this conversation in a way that's engaging, we can get by it, and not shut any doors from the very beginning. And that was a, one of the other really powerful things we found with this, is that it, it lets people engage in it the way that they want. I, I, I look forward to seeing this in the future getting down to like the 4-H level, where they're having competitions about the you pop the farm that's in the drop scenario, or your farm is going through a drought scenario, what do you do? And to get into that mindset at that early age into pre-planning for what we have on the farm. Definitely. And we have a, some other faculty in our department have a grant that just got going, and they're creating it's around water, um, like a crop beef integrated. I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, it's crops and, and beef, that integrated system. And they're actually working on creating a game map. Um, and climate is one of the pieces they want to layer in. It's still in the early stages, so they're not sure how it'll go. But I, I've started a conversation with them, and this might be one way that so the game, the idea of the game plays out over 30 years. So maybe you could give them different scenarios. So that's, I don't know how that will all play out, but that's one. To what extent does the the writing concern amongst the participants that they might be forced to adopt measures to limit greenhouse gas emissions, kind of get in the way of all this. Because we're talking about two completely different things here, but you know, talk about climate change and a dairy person kind of thing. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Even if what they're supposed to be talking about is nothing that has nothing to do with having to adhere to new regulations. Well, that is a lot of the barrier. That's because it's become so politicized that they get concerned about what does it look like and the tasks. 
But we actually found things like this where we started talking about adaptation and we don't actually talk a whole lot about climate change. Uh, we're mostly talking about weather trends. Uh -huh. and, and so we kind of think dip their toe in 